Okay, so hello and welcome to the Livon Glickman Show, the show that explores the human component around business and communication in a hybrid world. I'm Livon Glickman, your host, the global business development specialist, business relationships and personal branding amplifier and speaker. And I'm very, very excited to get to talk about one of my favorite topics ever, networking and business. different cultures with the one who have actually taken networking to the highest levels. Hello, Jordan Harbinger. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, what, what is the time where you are right now? Uh, it's 10 30 in the morning. And this is kind of like peak my brain working and on firing on all cylinders. So it's, it's good. It's, it's funny because when I was younger, I used to be like, how do people function early in the morning? And now I get up at 6.30. I have two little kids that helps with that. But then by 2, 3 p.m., if you ask me to do something that requires energy, it's like, eh, it's a tall order. Do, be, coming yeah. to a microphone to perform, so to speak, is not going to happen at about 4 p.m. It's just it exactly. lights out. So I think it's good, you know, thanks to the time difference that it's good that we caught you in the right timing. Yeah. Now in Israel, it's about, it's 8.30 p.m. And I always say that we're, I'm speaking to you from the future, kind of. So yeah. hello from the future. And <laughs> let me just share a bit about, uh, about you too. Those who listen to us who don't really know you by now. Mm. Um, so Jordan Harbinger is referred to as the Larry King of podcasting. He's a Wall nope. Street. Nobody in Israel knows Larry King, do they? No, they know. Actually, they know. Oh, Larry. they do? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, he's, no. he's <laughs> Jewish, so he's got that going, or was. So he's got that going for him. But that's exactly. about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you're also a Wall Street Wars, a L- Wall Street lawyer turned to a talk show host. And you have interviewed, that's amazing, over a thousand guests, deconstructing mm-hmm. the playbook of the most successful people on earth and sharing their strategies, insight, perspective with everyone else. And a few more very interesting points that you've hosted uh, a top 50 Apple podcast for nearly two decades with 5 million downloads a month, making you the Jordan Harbinger show, one of the most popular shows, podcast ever. I understand that you speak five languages. Yeah, correct? I mean, a ver- in various degrees wow. of fluency, yeah. Not, not, not like English and then everything else is just flowing so naturally, yeah. but yeah. Compared to an American, yeah, five languages, yeah. Uh, better than, than most people here in the United States anyways, but not, not probably as well as somebody who lives in Europe and lives on, in, in Italy half the year yeah. or something like that. You know, it's a different, different, different standard over here for sure. But still, you know, if we're here to talk about communication and networking, language, it's kind of, it's, it's a view to someone's world and, and, you know, culture. And I think it's such a great gateway to connect mm-hmm. with people. So. Yeah, I agree. Before, yeah. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. So about your networking philosophy and about cultural differences and how to handle them, especially if you guys are working with the U.S. So this is a great uh, episode for you to, to watch. And let's start it with, so alongside your great career and again, post, podcast creator, uh, lawyer, can you tell us a bit about your background and journey and what led you to teach networking being, you know, it's, it's a skill for success. Yeah, it's not a it, job. it is. So I, I was in law school and I remember doing these mock job interviews during law school and they were really bad. It was like, you just show up and someone would go, oh, you're going to be fine. And they weren't lying about being fine during a job interview. But the problem was when it came to finding a job, it was all just apply everywhere. The economy is really good. You'll get hired. And that at that time was really true. But I thought, well, this isn't always going to be true. I should probably learn how. how people find jobs in bad times. And I, I learned this lesson quite a few times, one of which was from when I actually got hired uh, at a law firm. I remember there was a guy there who was just, it was a partner, younger guy, never in the office. And I thought, this is a really good gig for him. You know, he seems to be this partner who's in charge of a lot of stuff. He never even comes into the office. I wonder what's going on there. So I kept getting hit with the networking angle from a lot of different places. Of course, what he was doing was building a book of business outside the firm. And so n- nobody wanted him in the office because he was more valuable outside the office recruiting business for the firm. But even before that, when I was in law school, I remember I met somebody who had moved to, To the United States from Kashmir, which is that that province in uh, Pakistan slash India, depending on who you ask. And it, she was some kind of royalty from there, and she was married to an American guy, and they were they were loaded. And th- they were really, really nice. And I say loaded because back in college, I had no money. So everybody who was an adult and had yeah. 
a credit card was loaded, but they really owned like buildings and boats and stuff. And I, I remember just saying, how come you are, how did you build this wealth that you have? And they were happy to share with me because I was 25, 24 or whatever years old. It wasn't a weird question back then, right? If you ask somebody when you're 40, they're like, oh, what are you getting at? When you're that age. So th they were really open to telling me this stuff. And they would say things like, come over to our boat on Thursday, we're gonna have a party. And I'd go, okay, and I'd figure out, you know, get a taxi and I'd schlep over their boat and there, I'd be meeting people there. And then she'd say, okay, on Saturday, we're having a fundraiser dinner at this restaurant. Why don't you come? And I'm like, oh, I can't afford it. She's like, no, 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 you're my guest, it's fine. And I'd be seated next to the re one of the regents of the university and the chief surgery of surgery at university of michigan hospital and next to me would be a dean from the law school and she'd be introducing all of us and i could tell they were like why is this kid here but it was really good because afterwards she'd go okay now what you do is you email those three people and you say nice meeting you i'd like to keep in touch uh, i really appreciate your time and expertise and you know my path is going to be this and i was like wow she this is nobody gets this yeah maybe from your parents if they're well connected which mine were not and you know grew up like with a dad who was an auto worker mother who was a public school teacher these are not people who are like on the upward yeah. executive track great people but not on the executive track of a major corporation anytime soon yeah. and so this kind of instruction was just absolutely priceless and i decided to teach some of this to law school students as much as i could so i i created with the, the career anyway. office, I was like, like a little elective, we call it, where you could have like a seminar that you teach. And yeah. I advertised it, nobody cared. Three women showed up. One was a, a, a Muslim gal that was like, you know, had a head to toe covering. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I'm not used to networking. We're not even where I grew up. You don't even talk to men, let alone like, let alone like reach out to people. It's just not a thing we do. I need help with this. Some of the other women who showed up were like, Hey, this is a boys club. We're joining uh -huh. wall street law firms. We've got to stick together. I don't really know how to do that. I grew up in a small town. So I started teaching these skills. And mm -hmm. as I started teaching these skills, it started to turn into a thing I really, really enjoyed. And there's yeah. all kinds of tangents that go along with that. That's how I started my podcast because I started recording those lessons. But later, jumping forward, as I started to work on Wall Street and realized that networking was the key to maintaining a job, jumping forward in my career, yeah. it became something where I realized that it was kind of like a secret weapon that most people didn't give a crap about at all yeah. and figured out when they were like 35 that they needed to be doing this and, nobody and teaches by then that. nobody yeah. teaches yeah and then yeah. and then when you're 35 you're sending emails that are clunky and you're reaching out to people from 20 years ago that you're like oh gosh this is going to be weird now you know and so starting early is just a massive advantage and i i learned that early on it was pretty fortunate it is it is and as you said like nobody nobody ever teaches that to us so it's, it's great that you you started teaching it as well um and that raises the next question you know i always say that while technology is getting so advanced so quickly, you know, the human brain stays kind of the same. So the question is, what is new in networking? Is there anything new about networking, about how we communicate, or the new thing is just the fact that we should do it or do it better? I mean, the, the new thing, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell because of course the age old networking concepts of helping other people get what they want or whatever yeah. have been around probably, probably since the old testament or something like that i mean i haven't looked recently but i'm sure that if you go into the talmud or something like that you could find an example of a rabbi being like you need to help other people without the expectation of getting something in return and it's going to be that but paraphrased and it's going to be in all of these books because that really was the way to build a really good army of allies and yeah. i mean that in any sense business military uh, trade yeah. anything so like you you can't say that networking ideas are new but the technology to be able to do it now makes it so easy i mean yeah. a few decades ago you had to pay three dollars a minute long distance to call somebody who lived overseas that you met once on a business trip that forgot about you and you have to deal with the time difference now you bust out your phone, you scroll to their number and you leave them a WhatsApp message and they find it in the morning when they wake up. I mean, it's just like the, 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 the barrier to getting this done at scale is almost totally removed. And yeah. you've got 
software CRM systems that say, you haven't talked to this person in six months, send mm -hmm. them an email and you click and it does it for you. You know, so that kind of thing exists now. Whereas before, I remember years yeah. ago when I was really learning how to systemize this, there was a guy named Keith Farazi who was like this networking guy from back a zillion years ago. Never eat alone, yeah. Yeah, he had like a shoe box full of business cards in at a restaurant. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, oh, whenever I get a minute, I have a ride to the airport later. And whenever I get a, a ride to the airport, I take these shoe boxes full of business cards and I just go through all of them and I send them all a note. And I'm like, what an exhausting, annoying, yeah. not scalable way to do this. But that was the way to do it. He had a Palm Pilot, I think, and he was in the process of digitizing these yeah. business cards. And I was just like, Oh, God, that looks brutal. No one's going to do that. But Keith Ferrazzi. So now you don't now you just need like a software membership or whatever. And you're good. You could even use Facebook or LinkedIn to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's true that you have systematized it. But let me take take the networking part another uh, kind of step forward. Sure. I want to talk to you about your show. Uh, because again, you have your own way to co of connecting with the audience. And my question would be, um, how do you build relationship with again with remote audience? And I want to take it uh, kind of re um, reframe it to our audience here, because it's also kind of building relationship with customers or followers. So how do you do it in your show in a way that connects with them? Yeah, so I I think I try what I try to do is when you're an attorney, you have to put your client first, right? It's called the yeah. fiduciary duty. There's all these different sort of ethical obligations. You have to put your client first. So as a podcaster, yeah. I try and put the audience first. And so what I mean by that is if I get a sponsor that I think is not good, I won't take the money, I won't run the ad. Mm -hmm. I don't go off on self-serving tangents very often, at least I'm sure it happens sometimes, we're all human, on the show, because I know that the listener is going, okay, why am I listening to this guy talk about this? So I try and earn every minute of the listener's time because let's say you waste 10 minutes doing something, well, now you've wasted 10 minutes times 5 million or whatever. That's like a, you could cure cancer with that amount of human manpower. Yeah. So it's really bad to waste people's time at scale like that. And so I try to keep that in mind when I'm creating the show. And not that there's 100% efficiency anywhere. I mean, it's still ed edutainment, but yeah. I try and bear that in mind. And that, that works really well. Another thing that I do is if somebody writes in, I reply always. Um, I follow up if they maybe the email gets lost. Like I really try and build real relationships yeah. at scale, which is tough, right? Because most creators just ignore their email. It's overwhelming. They don't bother. Yeah. There's no money in it, really, at least no immediate money. But I find that it's almost certain to result in longer lasting show fans if somebody writes in and I write them back yeah. and I say, oh, here's what I suggest, or I send them something that they ask for. Uh, in an email, I find that th there's almost, there's a near certainty that some of those people are gonna stay listening longer because of that connection. Yeah. And so that generates more impressions for the advertisers and yada, yada, yada. So it really is, it, and they're more likely to support sponsors because they think, oh, Jordan needs me to support his sponsors and he answered my email. So they're more likely to think of me when it comes to those kinds of things. So there is ROI to that. You just don't get it right away and you can't really measure it. So most people don't do it and I just, don't believe that's a good way to do business. So I try and do things that quote unquote don't scale yeah. and do them at scale. And it just, it takes a lot of time, but there's a reason that the show is popular and that those downloads, those don't count any YouTube impressions. That's like millions and millions more. I just don't count that because yeah. I, th I feel like it's a different animal. Uh, it doesn't count social media stuff. Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to connect that are more real than putting out a tweet or a TikTok or a, Exactly. social media post and i really love how first of all you kind of opened um the thought about it's not just you know who who listens or, or downloads it's really about you know the longer term how would they you know continue to listen to the show um you know support um the sponsors or you know or, or your your request and so on and and also when i approached you several times i think in the last two years you always answered so quickly and I, for me it was as you said it was amazing like he sees me he's there he's not just you know uh, which it's definitely it's definitely a game changer and, and a different um, than other ones uh, out there with all the I appreciate that. Else. Now yeah. we just talked about the fact that you you have traveled, you have lived in Israel, and apparently studied at the Hebrew University, and you've also managed 
uh, guided tours in North Korea, guys, North yes. Korea. Yeah. <laughs> which is exceptional in its own. Now, you know, so you know a bit uh, about different cultures than I would say average people who haven't traveled a lot. So when when you come to a new cult country or a new culture, what how do you start interaction, interacting in terms of business? What do you do? Yeah, it, it's usually quite difficult when you're young to do this. So and I was in Israel and I was young. So take this with a grain of salt that I don't know Israeli business culture at all. But now when I travel, I try and always if for business, I'm always coming in with warm introductions, right? I'm not just like showing up in London and knocking on office doors. That's not a good way to do things. Uh, I always try and find somebody who will make introductions to people yeah. with slash for me. So if I go to a city, I might make a list of five or even 10, depending on how long I'm gonna be there, people that I wanna meet. And I might have two or three of the people that I already know who are well connected over there. I might say, hey, let's do a dinner. Would you mind introducing me to this person? Can you see if they can make it on Tuesday, this person on Wednesday, this person on Thursday? And so they're getting the benefit of reconnecting with somebody who's in maybe a decent position business-wise. Uh, I'm picking up the tab, so there's always that's always nice. But yeah. then I'm getting the intro to that person. So I might have a, a well-known media figure who lives in London bring out another well-known media figure that I don't know, and now all three of us are connected and having dinner. So it's not this sort of awkward business date where someone's like, why am I here? What is he gonna ask me for? Why did I show up to this? They're meeting their friend and I'm also meeting their friend. And it's a much lower bar for discourse. It's much more interesting. It's much more relaxed. And that is extremely helpful because what I find is a lot of people who, when they do business, they'll say something like, I'm going to be in your area and I would like to take you out to lunch. And you're like, I don't know you. Are there going to be 20 people at this lunch? In which case I'm not going to get to connect with you. Or is it just going to be you and I, which then what if I don't like you, it's going to be weird. What are you going to ask me about? So when I go in with somebody else, it's always like, well, worst case, I'm hanging out with my friend. And if this Jordan guy is annoying, oh, well, but probably yeah. I'm not because I'm being introduced by their friend already and yeah. connection. So they know that there's kind of a win win no matter what happens. And I'm able to connect with them in, an, in a time that's relaxed where I'm not like trying to think of what to say next because they're already there with a friend. So it's three friends connecting, which is a much firmer platform to start a business conversation or any kind of conversation versus this awkward sort of speed dating business yeah. thing, business lunch thing that a lot of people try and pull off, which makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, I like it, I like it a lot. And you just mentioned that you you lived here like when, when you were younger. So let me tell you a bit about um, Israeli business culture through uh, by a certain book called Israeli Business Culture. Mm -hmm. They characterize uh, Israelis through the word Israeli. So it's about being informal, straightforward, risk-taking, ambitious, entrepreneurial, loud, and improvisational. I now, like it. Each of these yeah. can be positive and it can also be negative. But yeah, then again, definitely. This is, this is our <laughs> DNA. Now let's talk about how to bridge gaps, again, in different cultural behaviors. For example, when it comes to brainstorming, we ask questions, we cut each other's off, we're passionate, but that's how we, you know, mm -hmm. brainstorm. And yeah. yeah, I noticed that. Across, well, <laughs> yeah. So if you have any tips about if you come across as not like the American culture, how could both sides bridge it? You know, honestly, I feel like American business people would love to be less formal. We just feel like we are stuck being formal because of, especially pre-pandemic. Now I feel like, okay, I'm in my pajama pants on Zoom. It's hard to be as formal. But also there's less of a connection because you're oftentimes only on Zoom. I mean, I know people who started jobs in mid 2020, they've never met their coworkers. Oh, well, until recently, you know, they finally had a get together somewhere where everybody flew in, but like they've been working together for what, three years now? That's weird. So of course your Zoom conversation is a little bit not what it would be if you saw the person every day in the flesh, right? Yeah. So I, I, I would say that informal, don't even worry about that. I think most Americans dig that. I don't know about people over like 55. Maybe they go, oh, he's so brash. I don't appreciate that. I think younger people love an outgoing, interesting conversationalist that's informal, maybe yeah. a little bit. The, the loud, I think, is probably also fine. I mean, we have Italians. Mm -hmm. You guys aren't that different, right? It's, it's exactly. kind of like the Italian thing. A lot of gesticulating and sort of bravado in the conversation, whatever, fine.
Yeah. And yeah, exactly. It's it's fine. Um, I think the what were some of the other ones? Uh, so it was uh, straightforward, risk risk taking, ambitious, entrepreneurial, improvisational. Right. I think where a lot of Israelis and Americans butt head is the straightforward part, um, yeah. because. American. So uh, you've met plenty of Americans. They'll say something like, we should get coffee sometime. And you're like, great. What about Tuesday? Yeah. And they're going, oh, my God, I she's really going to make this happen. I do not want to do that. Yeah. That was just something I said. What do I do now? I'm panicking. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm just never going to answer her phone calls. <laughs> Two last questions. Um, sure. If we can create a better business relationship environment, obviously, it's business. It's personal. It's always personal. It's not only business. But what would be the one thing that you think that if we will all do, we could create better relationships? Uh, all do is 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 really, it's tough. I would say ditching, I like the inform, I'm on the informal thing. I'm still stuck on the eye in Israeli. Um, one of the things I like to do is every day I, I get my phone out and I scroll to the bottom of my text messages. This is part of my like six minute networking course that's free. I don't know how much you like plugs it seems corny to do that but uh, maybe later um okay. i scroll scroll down to the bottom i find somebody i haven't talked to in a while and i send them a message and it's not like hello i'd like to reconnect with you please mm -hmm. click on my calendly link it's like hey man how are you I haven't talked to you in a long time jordan harbinger in case you don't have my number saved uh i think we met like five years ago in san diego at a conference i've had two kids since then here's a couple of pictures let me know what you're up to of my kids. Yeah. Let me know what you're up to. I'm still doing my podcast. Not sure if you've, you know, ever checked it out. Uh, no pressure. Something just very chill that doesn't ask them to like buy yeah. protein shakes from my multi-level <laughs> marketing scam company or whatever, right? Yeah. And or join my cult. So people will respond well to that because they're used to getting mass texts that are kind of formal or spam emails. This is yeah. more like hey, I'm an old friend of yours, kinda, hope we're still friends, not sure if, you know, we haven't kept in touch, and I just wanna reactivate that relationship. And I think if a lot of people did that at, at in, on a regular basis, you'd find that your network really improves a lot. Because I talk with a lot of people, especially yeah. young folks, that say things like, oh, I don't have a network. You do, mm -hmm. you just don't have a business network in the field of semiconductors because you haven't gotten your first job. You know tons of people that you grew up with, that you've been around their parents who would gladly connect with you. You know tons of people, you just don't yeah. think of them as connections because they're not gonna like hire you tomorrow. And that's exactly. a bad way to look at things. Yeah, they don't think of them as connections. But also many people are afraid to do what you just said. And mm -hmm. in your course, which I take took it and also they're gonna be a link to it next to this video. You Thank actually you. give a script, you give a script to how to do it and how to do other uh, different small actions that can really make uh, a big uh, impact and also make us understand that, hey, we have a network, we have so many people that want to help us, they're just waiting for us to take this, uh, you know, take this step and, and do it. And last question again, you've, you've been around, you're, you're such a, a, um, a genuine people person. The question would be, in your view, what do people want? What do we want? I think everybody just wants to be appreciated or quote unquote seen is, is uh, how the yoga people put it. And, you know, as corny as that might be, I think it's really true because as a parent, I see it with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, kids, are they don't hide their emotions. They don't have pretense. Yeah. Your kids, what do they always do? Daddy, look at me, look at me, look at me. And I'm like merging onto yeah. the highway and I'm like, not, not a good time, Jaden. <laughs> right. And, and, but yeah. they want to show me that they stuck a sticker on each of their fingers. Yeah. And I'm like, why do they do that? You know, they're, are they trying to get my approval? Maybe a little bit, but they, and they want, they want to see that I, I care about them. Okay. Yeah. But adult humans are very similar. They're not sticking stickers on their fingers and asking you to look at them but they're doing pretty much that exact same thing in a more yeah. subtle way, right? They're starting a business and they're showing you on social media. Yeah, they want you to buy something, but like maybe you can't even buy something. Well, then why is that person sharing that on social? They want people to see what they've done and go, that guy has talent or that person is interesting or this person is doing something that I appreciate. They really just want that. And, and if you, it doesn't really cost you anything to give out approval Yeah, and being fake, not a good idea, but you can dole out something like, hey, I saw that you acquired another company for your marketing team. Like, congrats, that must feel really good. I don't have to be in the marketing agency or in the, that industry at all to give that level of approval. And another tip is when you give that approval, if you can do it in person, great. If you can do it in a way, I call this above the fold. It's probably, in a, it's a newspaper term. I don't know if you use it over there. It's a, because 
at the top of the newspaper before it's folded is the headline on the front page. Yeah. So uh, below the fold communication for me is like emails, um, social media posts where somebody just might not ever see it. A comment on a post that has a thousand yeah. comments, I'm never gonna see that. If you text it to me, I'm gonna see it because it gets to my phone and maybe out of those thousand people that commented, 15 of them or even 50 of them have my phone number, but like two of them sent me a text. Yeah, That's a better way to communicate because one, when you text somebody, it's like, oh, I have your phone number, you're in my little circle of trust. Yeah. So it means more, it gets to them. Text messages have something like 100% open rate within the first few minutes of it arriving. It's mm -hmm. very close to 100%. Yeah. So with emails, nothing of the sort, social media, even worse. So mm -hmm. try to have above the fold communication where you're talking to them in person or you send them a text or something similar like to call them, yeah. give, give that appreciation. And I do that with, with one person or two people per day yeah. as it presents to me, usually on social media. So to be clear, I use social media to find out what people are up to, but I don't use social media to reply to yeah. that outgoing communication. So I might see somebody got married. I don't click heart or type like, congrats, yeah. man. I send them a text or call them and go, I saw that you got married. Congratulations, yeah. that's really cool. Might even send a little video to them if they're a closer friend um, that I wasn't invited to their wedding, whatever. Let this example <laughs> just play it out, people. Um, that's and really yeah. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. It really does. Because you're one of two people that did that, except for their, aside from their parents, yeah. right? It's, it's a huge difference. Yeah. And it, again, it costs us nothing. It takes us nothing. Maybe another minute. And it yeah. really, really makes a difference uh, into our relationships and how people remember us. As you said, people, you said people want to be seen and, and hey, we saw you, we feel you, we care for you. Uh, and this small thing can really make uh, a big impact and yeah. amazing, amazing. Yeah. One more thing, if I can. Please. Cut the, cut, and this Israelis probably have no problem with this, <laughs> but I, I think as an American, one of yeah. my top tips I got to figure out how to phrase this for uh, the PG-13 audience, but I will say for your audience, just cut yeah. cut the bullshit because yeah. Americans will say something like, oh, how are you? Yeah, things are kind of slow here. What I like to do is go, I, I think about how the conversation would play out in my head via text or, or something, and I'll just cut the first few lines where I'm like, hey, man, what's up? I might even start with that, but then I'm like, all right, let's advance to the sixth or seventh yeah. text. So I texted my friend the other day and I, he's a very wealthy guy. Yeah. His dad passed away a few months ago. His dad was a super, super, super wealthy guy. Mm -hmm. And I texted him and I was like, Hey man, how are you? And he goes, good. And I go, do you think that you feel, do you think part of your success is pressure that you put on yourself because your dad was really successful? And he was like, dude, it's nine o'clock in the morning, like chill. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 yeah. sorry. I was just curious. And he goes, no, no, really. I appreciate this because most people don't ever ask me stuff like this. And he's like, uh, I think about it and he gave yeah. me an answer and he, and later on I checked out a couple weeks later, I was like, Hey, sorry for bombarding you early in the morning with that. And he's like, no, actually that's one of the reasons I value our friendship. He's like, I know yeah. we've only hung out a couple of times, but I can always count on you to ask me something that's not just small talk and it's very real. And so yeah. I've advanced this friendship with this person that I've only hung out with a limited number of times mm -hmm. because I'm willing to ask a real question that most people would yeah. They've got to be drunk to ask that kind of thing. You know, yeah. they just don't want to do They don't want to get rejected or they feel like it's awkward. I'm like, screw yeah. all that. If you can't have that kind of a conversation with your friend, it's not your friend. So why go through the rigmarole ahead of time? And I think Israelis yeah. are pretty good at that because they don't exactly. have time for your crap. Yeah. That's basically. definitely an Israeli thing to do. Like, hi, Jordan. Okay, let's do this. Like, you're just mm -hmm. going straight to the to the business. No small talk. No, you know, bullshit. So that's yeah. definitely a very Israeli thing of you. Yeah, to... I'm here for it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much, Jordan Harbinger, yeah. for being here, creator of the German Harbinger, Jordan Harbinger Show. And in order to connect with you, first of all, we talked about uh, the free course, the six-minute networking course on your website, jordanharbinger.com forward slash course, um, Apple and Spotify. Uh, people can find your podcast mm -hmm. there. Everything will be next to this video. And again, I want to thank you so much for yeah. your great smarts and good energy in the morning. And thank you all guys for watching the Ron Glickman Show. And we'll see you next time.